Thank you very much. Right. Um, you can call me Bal, though, you know, in a world of acronyms. Um, it's, it's, it's always good to kick off with a, with a three-letter. Anyway, I'm here to talk about uh, cyber resilience, uh, how to be cyber resilient. I want to do that within the lens of, of zero trust. Now, you've heard a lot about zero trust today. I want to give another perspective. You know, I want to give something, to, something else to think about. And I want to do that within the framework of, of managed XDR. Now, you might have heard of XDR. Um, I did a talk on XDR a few months ago where I just had one slide. It was a Death Star, right? For Star Wars fans out there, you know what that is. A lot of people think that's what XDR is. It's a be-all and end-all of everything. But it's not. It's a collection of things. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about at the end, uh, just to give you some perspective. But before we start, now you probably came to this talk thinking, someone from BlackBerry, are they going to talk about devices? Well, no. We don't do devices anymore at BlackBerry. Um, so our journey over the years has really had a, you know, it's been, it's been a really interesting ride at BlackBerry. When I joined, we were an MDM company. That's it. Um, we, we invented MDM. We had the first kind of smartphone and we had introduced app containerization to secure the, uh, data at rest, data in transit. We had all that. Uh, and on the journey, we acquired QNX to give us uh, secure technology in cars as well. Uh, and the space station, right? The space station is QNX somewhere. Bless you. Um, we also have QNX in nuclear power stations. Um, then we acquired a company called Atoc to give us what we call CEM, which is critical event management. So in the time of an emergency, you want to know if your resources are safe. You want to make sure you communicate uh, the emergency out in a timely manner on any device, wherever people are and account for their safety as well. And that, that solution was unique. It delivered something different. Uh, we acquired a company called uh, SecuSmart to give us secure voice capability. When you think about security, one thing, one area people tend to forget is the bit between your ear and the phone, right? And there's a lot of interception. Um, I, I remember speaking to ITN, ITN News. At the time, they had correspondence in uh, in, in Iraq, um, they were chasing down the, the Islamic State who could intercept phone calls and they wanted to be able to not intercept them. So that's, the, that, that's a really good use case for, um, for secure voice. But over this time, our, EMM, our MDM product evolved into EMM, endpoint management, endpoint uh, mobility and management. Uh, and then that kind of um, uh, evo evolved into UEM. Right, so UEM is what it is today, but we acquired a company called Silence in 2017, 18, um, and that gave us the unified endpoint security capability. Right, so that's who we are today. We are a cybersecurity company that delivers not just security with UEM, but protection as well to secure and protect. Um, and that's driven by this unique AI capability that Silence gave us. You know, they, they were. They were formed 10 years ago out of McAfee. Uh, two guys from McAfee left and they started up this, uh, this company. They thought, uh, this guy called Stuart McClure, uh, he called himself the chief apology officer because it was all reactive. You know, you'd get, uh, you'd get a, a threat, you, you know, something would happen, then you'd have to wait for a signature file to, to be deployed. EDR kind of lessened that time a bit, but I'm going to talk about that in a minute but it still didn't prevent, and that's what the AI capability gives. Right, so that's been around for a while. We are today looking to be a managed XDR company uh, within our cybersecurity division. We have an IoT division as well, and what's really exciting is the overlap. Right? How can we take this cybersecurity capability, for example, into cars? Right? How can we protect cars better? You might have heard a story about a Range Rover being kind of stopped on the M4 as it was driving, and it was just pulled to the side. Um, you know, hacking a car is quite simple. Um, you know, how do we prevent things like that from happening? Now, you see that image on the right, which probably isn't very clear, but that's a smart city. You know, that's our dream. That's our vision. We can do that. Um, you know, our vision is to protect and secure uh, every endpoint uh, we can under the sun. We want to make cities smarter but safer as well. Okay, so that's BlackBerry today. Now. I work in the cybersecurity division and I'm all about outcomes. I'm all about what do the customers need? What do our customers need? What do organizations need? Um, what do our CISOs need? 
Right? And when you think about the CISO and the CISO's current challenges, um, when I was doing UEM, um, I met CISOs and they would say, secure data at rest, secure data in transit, we want to prevent data leakage. Right? So, I mean, DRP had a different meaning, but it's pre prevent data leakage. Um, now, you know, they want to avoid information exfiltration as well. So data being pulled out. Um, they want to maintain a security posture, and that's all uh, to do with risk. It's they want to avoid, uh, they want to eliminate risk uh, from, from their companies, whether they're internal or external. And that's the interesting point here, because you could lose your credentials and you've got insider risk, right? Um, and that's, they do all that in addition to management, in addition to C-suite uh, collaboration and all the other things they do, right? So the CISO needs to get to sleep at night. It's quite, quite difficult. And they're faced with other things, right? And uh, not, not just risks, but there's a dilemma around how do they actually invest time and money in the right way? And there's been this divergence between the, the economic impact of cybercrime over the past few years and the out amount of money that's being spent against it. Now, what that shows is not that, it's not that enough money's being spent, it's that it's just not being spent in the right way, or it's not being spent at all. Um, a lot of it's reaction, right? Oh God, something's happened, we need a tool. What you end up with is a lot of tools. And what's happening is that's pretty much, I, you know, I saw this image last year, and we're tracking to this, to this curve right now in 2022. And that's why I still use it. Now, what's causing that dilemma are the, um, the trends in the market today. So when you think about um, managed XDR and where that fits in, let's look at what's driving the need to have an XDR solution. It's about convergence. It's about all of this data coming together. There's a lot of data sources out there. Um, there's a lot of cloud solutions that you need to think about. Data is being stored either in a central location or in a mesh. You know, it's multiple cloud locations, on-premise, um, data, <coughs> data lakes, separate data lakes. Um, but also, companies want automation. They want to be able to, to decentralize their operations, and that gives more risks, more windows of opportunity for, uh, for threat attackers. Um, but they want to do things as a service. They want to access as a service uh, points on the cloud, right? So there's more data that they want to, to access. Now, in terms of what's driving it from reacting to all of this, there's a lack of skilled resources. There's not enough people out there. Um, there's not enough hunters. Um, the risk is there. There's a lot of risk. There's, um, the risk is changing uh, daily, almost. And that's kind of exposing organizational holes, gaps, risk. Um, there's still a lot of cyber regulations out there and, and data privacy laws that you need to think about. And that kind of, that, that plays on the CISO's mind as well as the chief legal officer as well. Um, the attack surface continues to grow. Um, we call it endpoint chaos. Now at BlackBerry, we've, you know, we come from the endpoint world, but when we pivoted to software in 2013, we started to think about other endpoints and you know, putting our smarts on, on other phones. And the car is an endpoint as well. Um, but users want to use more than one device. You know, they'll use a desktop, a laptop, or, a, or an iPad, or an Android tablet, as well as their mobile device. You know, endpoints are, are dictating a lot of um, uh, attack surface complexity right now. Um, that last point, OT weaponization, this is an interesting point. So there's, uh, I saw a stat of 60% of, of, of um, operational technology out there is, is a key risk factor for those companies that have OT, like manufacturing firms, like utilities firms. Um, they're becoming more and more connected. You might have heard of Industry 4.0, which is the latest um, you know, trend. Um, you can say, well, it's a rev revolution, right? So the first industrial revolution, we all know about that. Uh, automation came in, in, in the third industrial revolution, but that automation and IT are kind of converging, right? And now that those systems are coming more and more connected, um, it's easy, easier to weaponize them, 
right? So that's, that's a risk. And it just depends on, on the market um, as well and the technology that dictates that risk right, that we need to think about. Now, typically people will tell you about recent cyber attacks, right? So there was a colonial pipeline, there was, you know, others. But there's, what I'm going to focus on today is process, technology, and people, right? You've heard of that term, you know, the three pillars of, of organizational rhythm, operational rhythm. Um, they have to come together. And when you see examples like the Morgan Stanley one of processing technology, right? So Morgan Stanley got fined for, for, um, for data breaches. You know, they weren't protecting the customer's data because they, if, when you remember, if you remember that curve, they're not spending the right money. Then, you know, the, the hardware is really old, it's really risky, but they haven't got the people in place to do the right things, right? And the SEC saw that, they saw right through that, and they said, you guys need to fix, fix, your, uh, fix how you do things and to protect your customer data. And apparently it was over a five year period. Right, so it's not like they, they missed something. It, it was something inherent in how they operate in, in terms of their processes. Insider risk is huge. All right, and this is where people come in. Um, you, might, you might have heard of the Uber attack. You know, it's all down credentials being compromised. Um, you can put, you put credentials up on, on the dark web and sell them. Right? And there's a lot of that going on. Um, and lapsus. Um, actually ran that particular uh, campaign and um, Uber were hacked because of that. You know, the credentials were leaked and they were bought from the dark web. That's inside a risk. You lose your credentials, compromised. Rockstar was uh, another similar um, uh, attack where credentials were stolen. But this time um, you had, um, you had the, the threat actors actually went into Slack Within, within Rockstar, they knew where to go because Rockstar were, you know, they're, 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 I'm not that good with, uh, with video games, but uh, they had GTA or something. They had the latest game um, screenshots. Uh, you know, what, what is that game? What did it do? You know, and they just leaked them. Um, so it was a similar attack. They went straight to Slack. They knew how to get there and it all came down to credentials. So it's not just ransomware, malware and, and phishing, which occupy about 70-80% of attacks out there. There are also process related uh, things you need to, to think about. And that's what Victor Zora spoke about uh, a couple of weeks ago. So Victor heads up cybersecurity in the Ukrainian state. Um, he was our guest speaker at BlackBerry Security Summit a couple of weeks ago. And he gave a good talk on how people process technology, play their part uh, in, in not just at the, at the organization level, but at the state level as well. He's an ex-CEO, so he, he understands how to bring all this stuff together. But he brought in an interesting point. Uh, he said, well, you can't do it with that corporation. Right? So you might have people process technology coming together, but how do you gel that together? Right? And he's completely right. You need cooperation. And what we're seeing right now, previously we were a IT ops, a company that kind of focused on IT ops. Now we're focusing on SecOps. Um, bringing those two teams together is difficult. I've been in meetings where I've tried to talk to my IT ops uh, customer and trying to get a meeting with the security team. It's been difficult. Um, but they need that level of cooperation because to be able to secure an endpoint and understand the behavior on that endpoint, you need to talk to your mobility team right? as a security person. You do. So he spoke about cooperation, but he also said, you need a strategy. And outside of a strategy, all you're doing is you're just fixing vulnerabilities. You're just fixing those holes, right? And you're, you're chasing your tail, right? And uh, what we don't want to do is give those adversaries, which are, you know, they're getting more and more dangerous. We don't want to give them that playing field. And he spoke about it as a kind of, this is the difference between life and death in, in you know, where he is. So it's quite scary. He could have got bombed any time during that interview. So it's quite shocking. Anyway, so that was the challenges that we see today. I'm sure they'll resonate with you. Um, how do you become resilient against those, those challenges? Let's go back to people process technology, right? And uh, talk about the problem. So there's a lack of visibility and resilience, right? There's 
reliance on inadequate technology. There's a lack of skills across cybersecurity. And because of that, what you get is people who are stretched um, or people who are probably lacking the right skills and they need to be trained up, right? So there's cost involved. The impact of that is, you know, um, also uh, outside of education. It's, um, you know, disparate solutions are being deployed. And, um, you know, companies are faced with with um, deploying and maintaining uh, expensive and disparate solutions, right? There's so many of them, so many screens to look at. And, um, you know, um, you get um, admin, admin hell. You get outdated tools and a little understanding of the true attack surface. And like I mentioned before, cooperation comes into that, right? So if, to understand your attack surface, you need to, you need to talk to various people um, that have a better understanding of your attack surface. Now, the last bit there, the solution, right? Um, adopt zero trust approach, right? You've got to have an approach and that's a good one. You might have heard in the past, um, zero trust being very hardware focused, defense in depth was very hardware led. It was very firewall led uh, in the past. It's kind of changed and we're going to go through that in a bit. You've got to be prepared to prevent and respond uh, to attacks, minimize that attack surface, right? And you've got to aim for fault tolerance. So if you do get attacked, you know how to deal with it um, quickly. And that's uh, another aspect of this is time. So um, when you think about the typical reaction to those challenges, security implementations typically fail because of, you know, when you're deploying all those disparate solutions, you've got a lot of projects, right? And that that you get a, what we call project overload. Um, how do you prioritize large projects? You're getting attacked uh, or you want to prevent something. Do you focus on that? You can't do that without process, right? You need to make sure that when you're investigating something, you've got the right tools, you've got the right people um, because subpar investigation leads to subpar outcomes. Um, and there's a lot of customization. So now we're going to technology, right? Long implementation cycles, you get, uh, you get consumption of many cycles of your analyst's time. All they're doing is they're, they're, they're changing values, right? Rather than hunting stuff, right? So you wanna make sure that, that you've got that side pretty much straightened out. Now, when you bring in what we spoke about, what Victor spoke about earlier on, bring people process technology, this is where cooperation comes in, right? So bring your people in process together, empower your sec ops, um, bring them together with IT ops, get that cooperation going, get your users on board as well. They have to know uh, how to stop attacks. They have to understand where they fit in the attack surface, that, that what they have on their hand is, is a window to the organization's you know, uh, data and, and, and um, you know, it's, it's pretty important that, that they uh, understand that. Um, get policy and procedures in place. Now, companies typically think, you know, I can do this, but sometimes they need help, right? And that's why uh, we would say augment those policies and procedures that are best practice out there, bring them into the company so you know um, what, what would work for your company, um, what would work outside of your company will work for yours. Um, and that, that requires cooperation. In order to take that process and make it work with technology, you need a framework, right? And that'll help you stay ahead of cyber threats. And that's what you wanna do. You wanna minimize damage to, um, to the organization. And the framework is needed along with cooperation to, um, you know, between your various teams um, to deliver that, um, that end result, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Let's have a little talk about, firstly, the framework, right? Um, zero trust, you've probably heard quite a bit about it today and you probably already know what it is, um, developed by Forrester in 2009 with goals to remove implicit trust. Trust isn't just there. You know, for those of you like me, old enough to remember in the 80s, the term trust but verify, well, that doesn't come into this anymore. It's don't trust, always verify. 
um, zero trust was brought in at the network layer, right? So the security would move now to the network, to the users, uh, to the apps and the workloads, right? So it would give that kind of that journey. If you can think about in the past how that how that might have, how that might have affected things. Um, so the network team was looked at for ownership uh, for zero trust, deploying the configure the core elements, work with all the other infrastructure teams to get that implemented. It was a, a network based solution, and what they called it was network led defense in depth. Right. So now now you had a solution at the firewall end. You had something. You know, within the infrastructure, you know, you had layers, right? So you had layers of defense in depth, right? So identify the users, um, set up access uh, controls, look at remote access, that kind of stuff, right? However, that's a very static way of looking at things, right? And it's kind of very hardware driven. Um, a lot of the risks at the moment isn't just at the port level, or looking at network risks, it's people, it's Credentials. We spoke about that earlier on. Uh, it's software. These things are dynamic. They're moving every second, and that's what we call mo the modern challenges. Um, and that's why we need a modern way of looking at defence in depth, because things change very quickly. Time plays a very, very key part in that. And it, you could almost call it a modern, modern approach to cyber resilience. Now, what we do at, at BlackBerry is the way we look at zero trust. Uh, is to think about the attack surface as that first point of contact, right? It's the vulnerability management layer that sits underneath your attack surface layer. Uh, it's, it's, it's got an array of, of what we call active security controls, right? And it's the quality of those security controls that will ensure that the time is preserved, that, that what we call temporal advantage, right? Um, because with threats, just to, to prevent them, time plays a key part in that, right? And you want to make sure you're in that, that green arrow. AIML makes that possible because you can predict things before they happen, right? Almost all things. Uh, things that do get through, you've got the right active security controls to stop it going any further and keeping that dwell time low, right? And traditional EDR, um, came out about 20 odd years ago. Um, you know, it improved the dwell time, but there was still, um, you know, time is still a factor here. And um, it's, while it's happening, it's impacting your systems, right? So you want a predictive control strategy to be able to, to prevent things from happening as much as possible, and AI delivers that. So um, it became critical to detect and react fast to um, abnormal behavior, which is based on adapting the trust, right? So we come back to adapting and adaptation, right? And that requires visibility, constant monitoring, and deep learning, all working together, right? You can almost say you need that part of the technology stack to cooperate, right? Um, um, visibility being the key one. So why is AI needed? And I'm gonna give an example of our AI um, when it was developed. So this is before we acquired Silence. Right? So I don't know if any of you have heard of Silence, but um, um, the first kind of, uh, the first model, the first ML model was released about 10 years ago. And we're in the kind of seventh generation right now. So it's the most mature AI you'll see out there. Um, what it does is it collects files. It, it looks at a file, right? And it sees what's good and what's bad. And what it does, it sees what's bad and then it parses the data and takes it out and it parses it and then it says, right, this is bad data. It transforms that data, vectorizes it. ML model gets trained. It, now it knows that there's a threat taxonomy in which this bad data belongs into. And that taxonomy, that family of threats grows. Right? So that's why our model in 2015 could, could have stopped the colonial pipeline attack last year, 2021, I think it was, 2020. Um, it could have stopped it six years later, all right, because um, it, it would have predicted the, the family in which that attack came from. Um, once that data is transformed, 
it's classified and, and clustered. Right? So think about an apple. Right at the very early stage, it's a red apple, for example. Right? Or it's a red apple you bought from Tesco. It's a red apple that's uh, a certain type of apple, or it tastes funny, or you know, it's a cooking apple. You know, what's happening is you're, you're getting more and more and more data about that apple as you learn more and more. And we, our ML model read about 5 billion files in 2015. Now it's at 1.5 trillion files. So there's a lot more it's learned over the past seven years. So that's a key part of, the deep learning is a key part of that prevent first capability. Now AI, it's important to know the difference. You hear a lot of AI out there. The difference between AI as a feature and AI based is key. AI as a feature, you get spreadsheets, for example, that have um, you know, classification of data. Does it fit within a certain field? Put it in there, done. It's not that, right? True AI gives you pre-execution prevention, deep learning, and um, you know, it works on the endpoint. It's, it executes on the endpoint, which means it works in air-gapped air environments. Uh, I mentioned manufacturing firms earlier on. A lot of them have air-gapped networks that are at risk. All you need to do is put a USB and you're done. Um, and you need to be able to prevent a full spectrum of threats. And that's what the threat taxonomy model is all about. Right, so a lot of the resource distractions you get from heuristics, EDR, they're not really AI. Um, it's just a distraction. What you get without AI is a reactive approach. You'll get, um, there's a lot of known attacks and malware out there, but you get attacked. Um, you collect, uh, uh, you, you see an indicator of compromise. You basically identify that. Um, you triage and classify that particular attack. But then the humans have to take over because they have to do their research. They have to look up the cloud threat database. They have to look at files. They have to look at the security updates, the signatures, the tests. And then they have to um, this, um, hunt and analyze those threats. What that is, is time. Right? It's taking up time. So you, you see that red arrow earlier on? That's going down. right? Um, and that's the problem about, about being reactive. So zero trust is actually being compromised when you think about that. Now, how would AI help um, a typical user? So you see this user on, on her endpoint, right? She's, got, she's built that trust, right? And yeah, anyone can do this, right? So she's using an app and with a network, her credentials have been um, recognized. She's behind the firewall, she's using her app. Uh, and she's doing what she needs to on the network of her choice, on the endpoint of her choice. What happens when she moves? Right? So you've got visibility and analytics, but what happens when she goes to a, um, a Starbucks in a war zone or something, you know, where the network's a bit dodgy? Um, she, needs to be, uh, she needs to have adaptive risk scoring, right? So her movements have to trigger something automatically. Right? She's in a dodgy zone stop the use of that network, stop the use of that app, right? It's that adaptation, that continuous level of trust, which is really key to, to um, adaptation and, and zero trust, right? Um, at the kind of mesh level. Um, so now the end, uh, the end user is the actual, um, is, the, uh, is, the, is the security perimeter as opposed to the endpoint, right? So that's the user's behavior that you need to take into account. And one example of this is, I just mentioned them a minute ago, is around networks. And we've got, we've got this capability called ZTNA, or ZTNA as my American colleagues call it. Network layer threats, right? So AIML has to kind of um, kick in very early on um, so that the user behavior anomaly is detected, the network behavior is detected. Um, there's zero, zero day domain classification. So if a domain all of a sudden becomes red, it needs to be known, right? Because it could, it could harbor risk. Um, you know, this is why having a predictive advantage for zero trust is critical, right? Because you need to stay above it uh, in, that, um, in that time curve you saw earlier on. Right, so um, just to summarize zero trust, it's a framework with no compromise, um, 
key is to adapt and prevent. Um, identity and risk is internal as well as external. Right? So just think about um, those two issues. It's to prevent damage and protect information and assets. Right, so that's where we are with, with the, you know, the people process technology, the challenges, what you need to do, the framework. But how do you execute? Now, one way is through um, XDR. Right? Um, you might have heard XDR, what it does. I'm not going to talk about what XDR actually is, but I want to talk about how XDR can help. But thinking about XDR in terms of outcomes rather than technology, right? we, you, know, you can get bogged down in solutions, but you, know, you need to think about solutions after you know the outcomes because those outcomes is where you understand how the people processes and technology fits together. Right, and that cooperation needed. And when you think about um, the evolution to XDR, you know, there's a whole bunch of tools um, that has to detect and respond and mediate, but they're doing it independently. Right, and what that's doing is uh, there's a lot of um, events that you know that are stuck and that are not getting uh, looked at. They're getting ignored. Right, there's no context, so it's no quick, easy, single view to trace an attacker. Right, across the environment and respond quickly. Right, so you need a way of thinking about that, and that's what XDR starts to bring together. Right, it's all about visibility and analytics of all the different sources of data. Right, so those sources could be emails. You could get alerts from a bad actor in an email or a data exfiltration event in, in um, if you think about DRP. Um, you get an alert. You'll, you'll probably get alert hell, depending on your SecOps team and, and what they're experiencing. Um, XDR will help reduce that time to detect and respond against those events. Uh, and it'll make more efficient use of resources. So now you have a way of looking at um, all the different sources of data, being able to capitalize on having that data located centrally, and being able to analyze that data as well and act on it. So that's kind of the promise around XDR. So it will help. But are you ready for it? Right? And this is. Um, where our head, of, our head of product actually said, this is a good question to ask people. Are you actually ready for XDR? Do you have EDR right now? And if you do, um, are you getting the most out of it? Are you getting the most out of the event? Are you getting the most out of the threat hunting, um, for example? Um, what about strategy for, for data and analytics? Do you have that strategy? And remember what, what I said earlier on about what Victor said. If you don't have a strategy, you're just patching things. Are your products and vendors XDR compatible? Do you have uh, partners who, who help you get that visibility? Are they XDR compatible? What about your people? Have you got the bright skilled people? Have you got the processes in place? Do you know how you want to measure success? Right, that's metrics. And without these four things, you're probably not ready. Um, and that's kind of where we can help, right? And the way we do it is through Silence Guard. Um, what we do is we focus on outcomes, right? We want to focus on the customer problems. We want to help you define your own XDR roadmap, build that resiliency 24 by 7 by 365. There's no point in having weekends off, right? Um, because you could, get, you, could get a, you could get a threat. Um, you could get attacked in the weekends as well. Communicating a crisis, they do happen. When you're communicating... Uh, you need to be able to do it quickly, and you need to be able to get to everybody, wherever they are, and whatever endpoint they're using. And you want to be able to measure success. Conscious of time here. Um, now, in, in terms of defining your own XDR roadmap, right? This is about a journey, right? It's about making sure that you've got the right data to make visible, to get the visibility to, right? So whether it's email, I mentioned before, email, um, data that's shared and file sharing, all that kind of stuff. All the data sources, you understand them, where they are. And you need cooperation to find out where they are. Uh, you need to integrate the processes together. What are the risks to that data? And where are the, where are the gaps in, in, in getting visibility to that data? And be able to expand and trust um, the, you know, the, 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 the processes around securing and protecting that data. You know, all this comes together. We've got 
a, um, and I urge you to read it, the Managed XDR Buyer's Guide, so you understand what that journey, this journey actually looks like. And it brings people and process together. Next one is building that resiliency. You need to get that visibility, that 24 by seven uh, visibility into your environment, understanding the threat actors, being a, one step ahead of them, um, getting visibility of you know, what is actually in your environment, what are the data sources, what is that telling you in terms of your heightened risk and how you're dealing with it. Uh, Communication is important. I mentioned before about CEM, um, critical event management. You want to alert people, communicate them wherever, to them wherever they are on whatever device they're using and be able to get that situation response back to you. As an admin, you want to know that if somebody's read that message and they're acting on it, right? It could be somewhere they need to go for safety uh, and you're telling them what to do. And when you get that message back, you have that level of comfort that that's happened. And step number four, measure your success. Remember before I said about metrics, if you don't know your outcome, your key goal from a metrics point of view, how do you know what success really looks like? Have you actually stopped something or prevented something from happening and prevented that risk hitting your users? Right? Has it actually worked? Um, are your users actually impacted without you knowing? Right? You need to know where you are with, with, with measurement and metrics um, of, your, um, of your approach. So just to summarize, to be cyber resilient takes four key steps. Focus on people process technology, bring it all together, understand the cooperation between, between all of them to deliver that plan, and then frame within a modern, modern zero trust approach, and then execute, then execute. Don't just look at technology first, you need to look at the steps needed to get to that point. And you know, that's where we can help with, uh, with Silence Guard. The guys at, the, at our stand downstairs are waiting to talk to you if, you, if you've got any questions, or if you've got any now, I've got a couple of minutes. Uh, to answer any. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.